I think he's running out of cash, or maybe people don't want to give him money. Like, well, ooh, who would want to get it, involved it, with this? It's interesting. There was a Financial Times story yesterday that showed that Donald Trump's, the number of contributors, yeah. have dropped $200,000. If you look at this point in the cycle four years ago with where he is right now, he has lost already 200000 Donors. Why do you think? Do you think they don't want to pay his legal bills? They don't trust that he won't use the money for his legal bills. Well, they, they, there's I, a lot of legal bills. I, I think there's. I, th I, I, I think there is the understanding that if they're giving him money, they're not giving him money to, to help whatever he says, help mm -hmm. make America great again. I, they're giving him money because of the fact that a judge said he raped a woman. And he's going to have to pay her about ninety million dollars. Eighty-three point three million because, um, but, for defamation, sexual assault. Because his own lawyer decided she didn't want a jury trial, and so they had a judge trial in a fraud case. And Donald Trump was found guilty of what he's done for but years. But then there's the, the civil fraud right. trial. Oh my gosh, that's well, that's, that's like bankrupting. Well, that's what I'm saying. So you have all this money. And so people are going, wait a second. Am I giving to him? Am I giving to like Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, like yeah. some PTL type scam to help pay this guy's bills? And what you're seeing is, again, the number of his contributors going down. I think there's also just natural attrition. There are a lot of people that I know that voted for Trump twice. We talk about it all the time. After January the 6th, after the craziness of the past couple of years, after saying that he's going to uh, assassinate his political rivals if he wants to and, and nobody can do anything about it, after he's saying he's going to execute American generals, American war heroes, because they're not uh, uh, sufficiently loyal to him, all of this stuff adds up. Mm -hmm. And at some point, there, there's an exhaustion factor that sets in. And I think we're seeing it in Donald Trump's money. Well, he's burning through his donors' funds with his super PAC spending far more in January than it brought in. As the Daily Beast reports, nearly $3 million of the overall spending was used for one purpose, to pay lawyers. The campaign itself was also underwater. It raised about $8.8 .8 million while spending over $11 million. Nikki Haley, meanwhile, flashed with a sign of strength, with her campaign reporting $11.5 million in receipts last month, it is the first ever fundraising period where Haley's campaign outraised Donald Trump's. Let, let's stop there for one yeah. minute. Stop right there. Nikki, let's repeat it. Nikki Haley outraised Donald Trump mm. last month in fundraising. After all of his efforts to try and undermine her and spread gossip about her husband and also she seems well, to be just plugging along there. She's going to hang in there yeah. and be the last woman standing depending on what happens. Yeah. It's probably a good gamble. You know, we have a lot more to talk about uh, in this story, but I want to stop for one second and go to Sam Stein. And Sam, feel free to, to talk about if you want to talk about Trump having less donors than before, uh, 200,000 less, if you have any, any theories on that. But I just want to stop for a second and look at the fact that the month that Donald Trump threatened Republicans, and man, that's, that reverberated. People aren't saying that reverberated around the Republican Party. Carl Rove's talking about it this morning in a Wall Street Journal op-ed. It reverberated. Donald Trump saying, basically, I'm going to crush you if you give Nikki Haley any money. What did that do? It caused Nikki Haley's donations to rise. And Sam, talk about the fact that, that fact Nikki Haley outraised Donald Trump last month. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty surprising. Uh, I think, you know, we all expected Donald Trump to raise a ton of money. Obviously, he has. Uh, the, the largest fan base in Republican politics, and not just, you know, any fan base, a sort of rabid fan base that kind of rallies behind him. Um, so theories as to why he has done worse than she has in this uh, latest month. You know, the, I think you guys hit on the main one, which is, you know, the money. Uh, people are, you know, nervous that the money is going to be going to non-political functions, obviously the legal stuff. But, you know, I, it's weird because obviously the polls show him doing well uh, relative to Biden. But if you're on the ground and followed his campaign in New Hampshire and elsewhere, you can tell, like, this is not as enthusiastic a run as 
four years ago or eight years ago. You guys remember that arena in Manchester, right? In 2016, oh, it sold yeah. out, right? To the to Crazy. the rafters, the entire thing was like. I went again uh, this cycle. Uh, they had a huge curtain uh, to cut off about a quarter of the arena, and they didn't have uh, the top uh, uh, sections. Uh, there were no one's allowed to sit there. Just thought to myself that you know the enthusiasm is not quite the same. And I think that hurts Trump on the donor level, too, because he has been so reliant on small dollar donations in a way that other Republicans can't. I don't think, just to be clear, I don't think any of this translates necessarily into uh, the primary polls being affected. I think Haley uh, is not going to win in South Carolina. There's very few opportunities for her to win any state, frankly, and the delegate math doesn't add up. But what it does do is, you know, to the degree she wants to continue running uh, and continue losing these states, she can do it. Because campaigns don't end, they run out of cash. Mm -hmm. And her campaign is not running out of cash. So she can sustain an operation. She can just sit there, be a thorn in his side. I don't know to what end. Uh, but that's what this money dynamic does do to the race. Boy, I'll tell you what, Willie, there are a lot of politicians that would love to be in Nikki Haley's position right now. Uh, I'm, I'm sure she's looking at it as a war of attrition. Donald Trump has so much in front of him. We don't know what's going to happen over the next two, three, four months between now and the convention. Anything can happen uh, on, on the Republican side with all of these trials, with all of these judgments, with all of his financial woes. Uh, anything can happen. But you, you, look at, you look at Nikki Haley and the fact that she outraised Trump last month, and then look at Trump. And this is something people, people love to talk about. Oh, well, you know, Biden's base isn't as excited as they should be. I'm pretty sure if you look at the last seven years, just look at data, look at history, they'll get there. Uh, but with Donald Trump, the stories we don't hear are the stories that Sam just said. And that is arenas half full, uh, at venue sizes being shrunk and reduced far below where he was in 2016. He still has his diehards. There is no doubt about that. He still has a movement, no doubt about that. But that movement has shrunk, and we haven't really seen uh, seen that as much in reporting uh, as we have focuses up, focus on, hey, what's the base think about Joe Biden? But right now, I mean, you look at the fact, again, Financial Remember Times Remember his crowd story. size situation in the first campaign? Yeah, well, that's what we were just saying. Crowds. They were They're just massive. But, I don't see those pictures. But, but well, I'll tell you what freaks Trump out even more is the fact that his small donors, which is absolutely critical uh, in campaigns, small donors have dropped by 200,000 people, uh, 200,000 donors from this part of the campaign to about four years ago. Yeah, that's a staggering number you cited from the Financial Times out with a report. In the second half of 2019, Donald Trump had 740,000 donors. In the second half of 2023, so four years later, ahead of election year, he had 516,000 uh, donors. Con contrary to that, uh, Joe Biden, has his number of donors have gone up a bunch since four years ago at this time. So, yeah, I mean, you're right. Donald Trump is asking his voters, asking his base to fund this self-proclaimed billionaire to fund his legal bills. That's what the money goes to. And it looks like a lot of people are saying, that's not really what I'm in this for. I don't want to give my money so that you can pay off all these more than half a billion dollars now if you add it all up. Russia is a gas station masquerading as a country. It's kleptocracy, it's corruption, it's uh, a nation that is really only dependent upon oil and gas for their economy. And so economic sanctions are important. Get some military assistance to Ukrainians, at least so they can defend themselves. Wow. That was the late Senator John McCain back in 2014 with an eye on Vladimir Putin's economy and his intentions for Ukraine. I wonder, well, I don't wonder, I actually know Willie because I spoke with John McCain um, in the last year of his life. I was going to say, I wonder what he would say about Lindsey Graham. Mm. You know, we, we had a, a conversation and he rolled his eyes and he, he said, Lindsey's so excited about playing golf with the president. He's like half gone already. Well, you know, he's he's fully gone now. I don't I don't think even Senator McCain uh, 
would ever, ever have imagined that Lindsey Graham would go from supporting Ukraine's fight against Vladimir Putin to following Donald Trump. And there are people inside the Senate, Republicans inside the Senate, outraged at Lindsey's flip-flopping and the fact that he actually voted against. And, and it made a difference to them. If Lindsey had voted with him, then there would have been at least half of the Republicans or maybe even a majority of the Republicans in the Senate voting uh, for this Ukrainian aid package. But he voted against it. And to, to think that that guy once called himself John McCain's friend uh, and, and, and saw McCain as a mentor for him, man, uh, it's just ridiculous. And it would, it would make Senator McCain uh, really sad. Yeah, and Senator Graham right. always, you know, fancied himself a defense hawk, right? He was the guy who was going to stand in the breach and help democracy survive and push Russia back. He talked like that until Donald Trump told him not to. And, and again, it goes back to the thing we talk about all the time. Is there anything Degrading. that these Republicans will not do for Donald Trump if he asks them, if he tells them? You can say no once in a while and maintain your relationship. You still get invited to Mar-a-Lago to play golf. You can still hang out in the cabanas and have fun down there. Maybe if he gets reelected, he'll put you in his cabinet, which I suspect is what Senator Graham's up to here. Or just being close to power uh, is his goal. But, man, you got to stand for something. And Donald Trump has stripped away whatever principle there was, if it was ever there, has stripped it all away in so many Republicans. Well, I, I, I've known Lindsay since 1994. We came in together in Congress. And, you know, Mika, I, a lot that he does does not surprise me uh, because he, he, yeah, there you go. That's perfect. His finger's always in the wind. Mm -hmm. He always tries to find his sponsor and he follows his sponsor, whoever that may be. It went from being John McCain to Donald Trump. But I will say that even this surprised me, him abandoning Ukraine and, and it's 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 just most critical moment where it's it's nationhood is at risk. It's liberty is at risk. It's freedom is at risk. And, and Lindsey Graham has made trips over there. He knows Ukrainian children are being kidnapped. He knows innocent civilians are being killed. He knows that Vladimir Putin, he knows this. He's talked about it throughout his career. He knows Vladimir Putin will not stop at Ukraine. After Ukraine, it's Latvia, it's Lithuania, it's Estonia, it's Poland. Lindsay knows this. And yet, washes his hands of it. Washes his hands of it and betrays not only the Ukrainian people, but he betrays NATO he betrays Western democracy, and he betrays the whole idea of the West. The whole idea of the, of the West, that Vladimir Putin and communists across China and North Korea and the mullahs in Iran, that idea of the West that they hate and that they are at war with, every day and it is a battle it has always been a battle and right now lindsey graham is siding with the enemy he's siding not with the west but he is siding with vladimir putin and with 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 with, with communist china and so so are many house republicans with 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 communist north korea because lindsey voted no to supporting Israel, he voted no to supporting Ukraine, he voted no to supporting Taiwan. Oh my God, the message that sends to communist leaders across the world who want to destroy us is just shocking. Jonathan Lemire is still. Earlier, you know, I was just talking about Lindsay. I served with him in the House uh, starting in 94. You served with him in the U.S. Senate. And, you know, Lindsay's Lindsay. You know, we know he kind of he goes with the wind. But I think I, you tell me if, if you don't feel like me that I mean, I'm sure you're even surprised that he has betrayed Ukraine, betrayed Israel and betrayed Taiwan. All because Donald Trump told him to. Yeah, I sat across from Lindsay on the Armed Services Committee for 12 years. 
And if somebody would have told me during those 12 years that there would become a time that Lindsey Graham would vote against essential aid to Ukraine to stop Putin and vote against aid to Israel and vote against aid to Taiwan, I would say, well, I, I will bet whatever money you have that that would never happen. I had no idea that he had this character flaw. I had no idea that he was this really, frankly, disturbed in terms of needing approval from someone that has more power than he has. And it's, it's, it's just frightening to me that he would do this. Now, if you look at the list of people who voted no, from the new supposed rocket star Katie Britt, who supposed to be a McConnell ally and was handpicked by what I would consider the traditional Republican Party, and you look at Tim Scott and you look at J.D. Vance, what you see is a list of people who want to be vice president. They all voted no. They all voted for the new Republican Party that is pro-Putin and pro-making consumers in America pay more for their TVs and many other washers and dryers and many other things because of a, 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 a trade policy that does nothing but punish Americans who buy things by making prices go higher. So it is it is just mind bending to me that Lindsey Graham has become this. But this is who he is and we should recognize it. Well, and, and, and Donnie Deutsch, we're showing pictures of Donald Trump uh, with Vladimir Putin, of course, going back to the Lemire press conference. Uh, nobody will ever forget, I think, as long as Donald Trump's in politics. Uh, when Donald Trump look at him, he, he was he was just oh my God. submissive. To Vladimir Putin, so much so that when Jonathan, our, our own Jonathan Lemire asked, hey, do you trust Vladimir Putin more or your own intel chiefs that you appointed? He's like, uh, uh, I, I trust Vladimir Putin more. And, you know, this is shocking, but I still believe, I still believe in America that siding with Vladimir Putin over Ukraine, over the West, over Western democracy, over freedom, I still believe that has consequences with the American voters. I still believe that Americans believe that we're a city shining brightly on the hill for all the world to see. And like Ronald Reagan, that we, we are the torch of freedom that is spread across the world. I believe it. Joe, I believe it, And I too. think most Americans believe it, Donnie. And I do not believe that Americans will support a guy and put him back in the White House who betrays Israel, who betrays Ukraine, who betrays Taiwan, and who betrays freedom fighters across the globe. I don't believe it. Donald Trump betrays pretty much every issue where the American people are. I mean, it starts with Putin, and it starts with our role in the world, and it starts with protecting Ukraine, it starts with protecting Israel, but it also goes to protecting a woman's right to choose for her body. It goes to protecting against immigration, against the, our borders. It goes for protecting against democracy. You know, we, there's a right track, wrong track issue in, in polls all the time. There's a right side, wrong side. And what's stunning is beyond his own kind of personal liabilities on the issues. He's wrong on everything. And two things are going to happen as, and you guys touched on this in the previous hour, as we get close to the election. Number one, we're going to see more and more of Donald Trump. To me, if I had my way, there would be a town hall meeting every single night. So as the light shines brighter on Trump, people are going to, as you talked about, it's a binary choice. It's Trump or Biden. They're going to go with Biden. And as the light gets shining on the issues, he and the Republicans are on the wrong side of just about every issue that matters to Americans. And that's what wins and loses elections. And Mike, uh, we were talking about how Donald Trump is narrow casting when he talks about abandoning NATO allies and making them pay up. Very unpopular minority opinion, according to this new poll that we've been talking about this morning. And so, too, is this Senate position on Ukraine. Americans believe it's important to help Ukraine in this fight. They don't want to see Russia win. So they're digging deeper and deeper in fealty to Donald Trump into these positions that are not popular in this country. Yeah, what partially by people like Lindsey Graham, yeah. Joe and Mika have just pointed out, a sad, spineless figure that we thought we knew, but we don't really know. And to Joe's point that he just raised about people in this country, what they believe in, they believe in the country, first of all. And I'm wondering, yesterday, the former guy, 
DJ Trump. Here's what he said in that town hall meeting. We have a country that's dying. We have a country that's failing, a failing nation. We have a nation in decline. We are a nation in decline. And my question is, to the people out there watching, to the people who go to work every day, who raise their children and pay their taxes, why is it that this new Republican Party, so many of them, people like Donald Trump, people like Lindsey Graham, why do they hate America? I, it's, it's a great question, and it's one that I've been asking for some That's time. A really good question. Why do they hate America? Why does Donald Trump hate America? Why does Donald Trump say America? Forget about the hating. Why does he lie about America? It's Nancy so much? Pelosi's question. Why does he always lie about America and tear down America? He says we're in a nation in decline. Please, please try telling that to their allies. They will laugh like a bitter laugh because they look at the United States economy and they're jealous. Mm -hmm. They're jealous because our economy is stronger than any economy in the world. We've had people coming on this show since 2007 saying China was going to overtake us. Their economy would be Lord. No, it's just not happened. And as I said in 2007 and 2008, and people pushed back on me, it's still not going to happen. The U.S. economy has a $25 trillion GDP. It's how big our economy is every year. China's at about $17 billion. Europe, the EU, that Donald Trump hates so much, about a 22, 23, 24 billion GDP. Together, the United States and our European friends have a 50 billion dollar economic machine. Russia, 1.3, 1.4 billion. Almost 50 times, almost 50 times the, 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 the size, our economies combined. Of, of Russia's and more than double of China's. Our economy is strong. Our numbers better than anybody else's numbers. Are there some pockets that need to be improved? Are groceries still too expensive? Yeah, groceries are still too expensive. Americans are paying about 11% of, of their paycheck for groceries. That's about what they paid, you know, in the 90s. But, you know, it's got to get better. But overall, you look at jobs, you look at GDP, you look, you look at every trend. We're doing better not only than our allies, but we're doing better than the people who consider the United States our enemies. And our military, they lie about our military. And, and I served on the Armed Services Committee uh, in the House. I know you served on the Armed Services Committee in the Senate, Claire. You've seen how great... Our men and women in uniform are, they are, God, they're the best of the best. And you look at every rating from around the world, rating militaries. The United States military, stronger than it's ever been relative to the rest of the world since 1945. There's not a close second. In fact, in the latest ranking I saw, Russia was second. And Russia's a, a, a military is collapsing. Russia was second to the U.S. military. And yet Donald Trump lies about America's greatness. Donald Trump lies about America's men and women in uniform. Donald Trump lies about what small business owners and entrepreneurs and and and. And the geniuses of Silicon Valley and what the, the geniuses on Main Street USA, what they're all doing, what they've done to rebuild our economy after COVID. The lies. I don't understand it, Claire. Why do they bash America so much? Federal prosecutors are asking a judge in Los Angeles to review the decision to release a former FBI informant with links to Russian intelligence. Why would you release him? I don't, why would you release him? I don't know, him? but why is everything with Donald Trump goes the back to Vladimir Putin? The guy has flight risk written on his forehead. And they go after Hunter and Joe Biden, and it's about Russia. Um, so anyhow, charged with lying to the FBI about Hunter and Joe Biden during the 2020 presidential campaign. The move comes after a federal judge 
ordered Alexander Smirnov to be released during a detention hearing in Las Vegas on Tuesday, but with several restrictions, including GPS monitoring and surrendering his passport. Special counsel David Weiss's team is now asking the federal court in California to keep Smirnov in detention because the California court will ultimately oversee the trial process. Prosecutors call 43-year-old Smirnov a serious flight risk and point to his extensive foreign contacts, which include someone in charge of a group whose job it is to carry out foreign assassinations. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't That's think not good, we want to release him on his own And whom Smirnov implicated in a lie about Hunter Biden. That, Prosecut that Republicans in Congress swallowed up. Yes, they Russian did. Russian disinformation. Whole. Great job. Prosecutors also contend Smirnov's lies present a current danger of election interference. The judge has not yet responded and an additional court date has not yet been set. Smirnov has been key to the House Republicans' impeachment inquiry into President Biden. And Republican House Judiciary Chair Jim Jordan insisted yesterday that Smirnov's indictment for lying to the FBI does not change anything. Wait, wait. So, 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 Mika, hold on a second. So, yeah. they've got a Russian, uh, basically, a, 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 an informant that's spewing Russian disinformation. Yeah. And they say, oh, no, that's fine. Yeah. Right? It doesn't change anything. Then there's another key witness that they were freaking out, going, oh, he disappeared. Where yeah. did he go? Where did we can't? Well, he's an international fugitive. Doesn't change. He anything. smuggled, illegally smuggled Iranian oil to the communist Chinese. He illegally sold arms. Like this guy, again, still, still talking about a flight risk. He's still flying right now. Listen. And look at all the people, Comer and Arnold the Pig and all the other people on that committee and, and Barnyard Animals. Look at what they're doing right now. Like, they're still holding on. They're holding on tight. Despite the fact they keep, boom, getting, boom. Yeah. Keep, boom, no, getting we, in we the face. We would show you Jim Jordan trying to explain this, but it would make your teeth hurt. Here's House Oversight Committee ranking member, the Democrat, Jamie Raskin. It does. Who says they just need to drop it. Yeah. Just enough. drop it. Please. I was hopeful that Chairman Comer would be announcing today the end of the whole impeachment investigation. It's been a wild goose chase built on conspiracy theory and lies from the beginning. And now we know that Russian intelligence operatives were behind creating the propaganda and disinformation at the very foundation of this investigation. So I think it's time for uh, Chairman Comer and the Republicans to fold up the circus tent and we should get back to work for American people. It's amazing. Oh my God. You, uh, and a, a congressional investigation built on Russian propaganda and lies and built on international futures. Not dangerous Great at all. job, guys. Let's bring in congressional investigations reporter for The Washington Post, Jackie Alamany, and NBC News justice and intelligence correspondent, Ken Delaney. Jackie, 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 what next? I mean, this, the, this Comer committee, and this is me talking, not you as a reporter, this is me talking, but... Uh, the way it, it looks to me is this Comer committee has humiliated itself time and time and time again. And now we find ourselves in a position where they just opened their arms wide and accepted Russian disinformation and propaganda to come in to the United States Congress. That, that's exactly right, Joe. And to be very clear, I mean, the impeachment inquiry into Biden was never quite alive in, in the House, uh, at least as compared to the impeachment of Alejandro Mayorkas. But there's always been skepticism uh, and an inability for James Comer and Jim Jordan to convince more of their skeptical colleagues that they, there was a there there, that they had been able to unearth anything. And, I mean, these accusations that Comer and Jordan have leveled for, for the course of, of a year, really, have never fully panned out. But the basis of this investigation, even before this whole debate over the 1023 confidential human source materialized, um, that, that James Comer and Jordan, in, in that clip that you showed at the top of the show, have claimed is true, has never been true. This is this idea that Biden fired Ukrainian prosecutor Viktor Shokin because he was looking into Burisma. 
The Washington Post, The New York Times, many mainstream outlets have reported over and over again that there's been no such proof to show that Victor Shokin was investigating Burisma or interested in Burisma in any way, and that Biden deciding to fire Shokin was related to him investigating Burisma. So, I mean, this this confidential human informant sort of blowing up in a, a really uh, spectacular fashion on the heels of a, a number of other missteps that House GOP investigators have committed at, at this point is, I think, just a very public version and view into the double dealing and the backspeak that that Republicans have been engaging in when it comes to presenting these pieces of evidence. Even at the time last year, I was on the show, we were talking about how uh, Comer and Chuck Grassley were engaged in pure political theater in really using process of the House to elevate what they knew to be unsubstantiated claims. And what we reported at the time were claims that the FBI under and the DOJ under Bill Barr, the Trump during the Trump administration, had looked into, found not to be supported by the facts and there and, and subsequently closed the investigation into this guy. Um, but now, you know, I think that that indictment couldn't make it clearer that this, again, foundational piece of evidence uh, is it has been fabricated. But we, I do want to note as well that that Smirnoff is uh, very clearly thought to be by the J Justice Department a, 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 a liar and a very untrustworthy uh, com confidential human source and that he claims to have had contacts with Russian intelligence. But at this point in time, we don't actually know or have further corroboration uh, that he has actually had those contacts with high level Russian intelligence. New polling shows the likely 2024 presidential rematch between Joe Biden and Donald Trump remains tight. A new Quinnipiac University survey has Biden up four points nationally among registered voters. That's within the poll's margin of error and essentially unchanged from a survey taken last month. A poll from The Economist and YouGov has Trump with a one point also within uh, the margin of error. So joining us now from uh, Pennsylvania, Democratic Senator John Fetterman. It's good to have you on the show this morning. Um, a lot of questions for you about what the Biden campaign can do moving forward. And I think one of the big ones is how do they approach the constant disinformation from Republicans who are right now blaming the Biden administration for not closing the border? Well, cl closing the border, I, you know, I think the president has been very clear that he has a has a, to, to act about that. And, and I fully support that as, as, as well, too. And now the Republicans are never going to uh, have a kind of a deal now because they, they don't want that because it's too valuable to have it as, as a weapon. And, and I think now it also could be helpful to just bring H, H.R. 2 onto the table and, and almost kind of challenge them to, to let's say, hey, here we go. You know, are we w willing to go this far because we do need to make sure that this border needs to be secure? Yeah, we have uh, Reverend Al Sharpton with us, Senator, and he has the next question. Reverend Al. Senator, uh, one, one of the things I've watched as you began campaigning for Biden is uh, dealing with the fact that there's misinformation and a lot of noise on the right that, uh, that are the ones that are supporting Trump. But you've also said that you're not going to let people just answer with noise on the so-called left, that you're going to try to do what you think is uh, right for the American people. Talk about it that uh, uh, a little that we do not need to counterbalance misinformation and noise and and uh, uh, things that are being demonstrated by the zealots on the right, but that we need to define what's good for Americans. I think that that's the kind of road you're trying to project in your taking on so-called progressives, who I call latte liberals, uh, who want to prison uh, imprison you with an ideolo uh, ideology rather than deal with what people want to see done in this country? Well, well, the Republicans are shameless, and they've always been that way. And I don't know why anybody asks surprised that now that they, they have any kind of shame at all. And they are willing to lie, and they're you know, right now. Vance just pointed out that he's lying about the Ukrainian aid, and it's very clear that, that all of the that aid is going right to uh, American companies that that produce these kind of munitions as, as well, too. They're willing to carry any water for Trump. And I'm not sure where this kinds of now 
fetish for Russia ever became as well. But I'm old enough to remember when it used to be the evil empire. And now you have a part of the Republican Party that are willing to stand with them, and they're actually embracing them as well, too. And it's truly astonishing that you are willing to yet, excuse me, to let Ukraine fa fail as, as well. It's absolutely astonishing. They assassinate top uh, critics, and they are now have been empowered to act that way. And I don't know why we can't just want to lean in and deliver for both uh, Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Senator, good morning. It's great to have you on the show. Just want to get a sense from you on the ground in Pennsylvania, a state that, again, obviously will be pivotal to the presidential election as it was and so close and Joe Biden won in 2020. What's your sense of the feeling on the ground there? We have economic data that shows a very strong economy, but a lot of people in our country aren't feeling that right now. What do you think will tilt this election one way or another in your pivotal state come fall? Uh, it's going to be close. I've always predicted that it was going to be really close back in 2016. And the polls really you know, predicted that Clinton was going to walk in, in Pennsylvania. And I knew that wasn't going to happen. The same thing in 2020 as well, too. Biden has up maybe five points back in 2020. And I'm like, that's just not true. And now it was very close. And that's the same thing is going to be in 24 as, as well, too. And I do fundamentally believe that Biden is going to carry that as well. And I'm proud to campaign for him just the way I was proud to campaign with him in 22 when now uh, people were saying that it's you know, too uh, not popular enough to uh, to be seen with him. And I'm proud to be seen with him anytime as well. He's been an incredible president. Senator, we just had an amusing Zoom filter uh, moment there, it looks like. Uh, good to see you this morning. Uh, let me ask you about right now. Uh, there were some concerns about President Biden's popularity with the core pieces of the Democratic base, including progressives, young people, some of whom you've really reached in your campaign. What does this message need to be to them to make sure they come out for him this November and don't opt to stay home or find a third party candidate? Well, I, I think I think the president has done an incredible job as well, too. And by any any metric now, you know, the president has been incredibly strong as well, too, now. And if you are talking about young progressives, it's like literally yesterday, he now is canceling more student debt as well, too. And now you have in Alabama now uh, now you have embryos now being having called, you know, real be beings as, as well, too. I mean, look at the kinds of things. This 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 election is always about you know, two very stark choices as well. And that's the kind of thing I talked about in Reno as well, too. It, it, it's like we have a major choice in our America. Uh, what we what we want to be for the next four years as, as well, too. And Joe Biden has done an incredibly tough job as, as well, too. And now I can't imagine why that Trump is, is competitive, but, but he is. And now he uh, has now... He can't be canceled now by the by anybody at this point. So now there's only one person. I believe there's only one person now that can beat Trump, and that's that's Joe Biden. Because right now he's the only person in America that actually has beaten Trump in in a policy uh, yeah. election. That's true. Yeah. Let, let me ask you, Senator, one final question. Um, as you go around Pennsylvania, as you hear from your constituents. What, um, what is the most important issue facing them? What do you hear the most from them as we move into this uh, incredibly important election? What's the issue that you keep hearing about? Again, I think the most important issue is, is like, what do we want for this state and what we want for this nation and what we want kind of a world order is, is as well, too. And it's going to be very competitive as well, too. And the president is going to win here in, in Pennsylvania. And I've always believed that whoever wins Pennsylvania is going to be the next president as well, too. And this is going to be it's going to be difficult. And we all have to lean in on that. And we also have to start having you know, all kinds of Democrats criticizing the president, too, publicly. I, I don't understand why. I, I don't know what's in it for you to do that, whether you're just chasing clout or you want to make it in the news or anything like that. But if you're not willing to just support the president now and say these kinds of things, you might as well just get your MAGA hat because you now yeah. are helping Trump at this. Democratic Senator John Fetterman of Pennsylvania, thank you so much for coming on the show this morning. We really appreciate it.
Thank you. And 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 congratulations to congratulations. Him. I think someone texted him congratulations, yeah. and it made that confetti thing happen. That I, was I, I hysterical. Don't, I don't know, but I that like. That's awesome. I want that to happen to me. I, a massive text outage from friends and and people saying, "Hey, don't call me. We can text you on Wi-Fi." But just massive outage for cell towers. What's going on? Well, talk, talk about technology and the importance of it and the importance of having an infrastructure that doesn't go down. We're feeling it. If you're an AT&T customer this morning, uh, at least 73,000, maybe over 100,000 people reporting uh, an outage. It does appear that the network is back up. Uh, some people were trying to call each other over Wi-Fi and, and the like. But uh, this didn't affect people on Verizon, didn't affect people on T-Mobile. But uh, the, we'll be getting a report, I'm sure, from AT&T as to how this happened, but goes to the whole idea. You know, people talk about wired phones at home. Um, we've all moved to wireless, and it's just it's just another example of how important it is to make sure that the infrastructure works. The good news is uh, it's not too frequently where we're having these reports, but, of course, uh, yeah. when they go down, if it were to happen on a wider scale, you could see the problem pretty quick. Let me ask you, do you have a hard line at home? I still do have a hard line at home, but attached to my cable provider. See, that's, that's a problem. That's not the same. That's a problem. I mean, I, I, I do, I too, wherever I go. I do, too. I want, like, Ma Bell to come, and I want him to run the wire in, and, and right. you know, I want a hard line that's not attached. Uh, but you just can't get it, it seems. Do you, the only person who calls my, my phone, though, and you, you've met her, is my mother. So do you, do you, who calls you on this phone number? Or do you just do it as an um, emergency situation? I mean, <laughs> so, I, so I give it to my kids uh, and say in, in case. I do. Yeah, Mika does, my kids, and in case, in case everything goes down. And, of course, TJ, uh, you know. Well, yeah. To call Mika. Yeah. Um, but, um but yeah, I, I do, and but it's just the idea for for days like today when it goes right. down, you've got a hard line, especially you know with kids, you just have to stay in touch, right? We'll all be having hard lines, and then we'll probably have Starlink backups in the future. Where we'll be using satellites. I mean, that's where you I think need this to is have a hard line backup. We and we need one. Let, let's go around the. As former President Donald Trump continues to say he would abandon NATO allies and calls into question whether he would support Ukraine, President Biden says he will announce a new sanctions package tomorrow aimed at holding Russian President Vladimir Putin accountable for the death of opposition leader Alexei Navalny. That would follow the new round of sanctions the European Union just approved. Meanwhile, European allies are watching to see if Speaker Mike Johnson will bring up for a floor vote the Senate passed bill that includes aid to Ukraine. EU members have committed more than $150 billion for Ukraine since the war began, ranging from military assistance to humanitarian support. At the Munich Security Conference last week, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky spoke about the strength of the alliance. There was a myth that Europe is too weak to defend itself. Instead, Europe has become a global force overcoming dependencies on Russia. Europe now demonstrates that our community deserves to be called Euro-Atlantic. There are two costs. Nearly 80 years of preventing a continental war in Europe relied on the strength of the American coast and now we see that the European coast can also be, be the force that prevents chaos. Let's bring in ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee, Democratic Congressman Jim Himes of Connecticut. Congressman Himes was in Munich last weekend and met personally with President Zelensky. Congressman, thanks for being with us. Uh, what did you hear from President Zelensky about the urgency of this aid package, which, as you know all too well, has been held up in the House of Representatives? Yeah, absolutely. And we heard um, Zelensky and his people say uh, this is a turning point in the war. Uh, if we are cut off from U.S. aid, we will slowly lose this war. Uh, and he gave example after example. And, you know, no surprise there. Um, what was a surprise was, and was honestly very hard, was the juxtaposition of an example of precisely how murderous Vladimir Putin is uh, with his widow, literally two hours after she learned uh, that her husband had been killed in an Arctic prison, addressing Munich, and then coming to meet with us. I mean, the fortitude was unbelievable, but the demonstration of Putin's murderousness, along with just the sheer hypocrisy 
of my Republican colleagues who listened to who listened to Zelensky and said, oh, we're going to work so hard to get this done. We're going to work so hard to get this done. And then you say to them, well, are you willing to, for example, sign a discharge petition, which is one of the ways we could get Ukraine aid to the floor? And they say, oh, oh well, uh, that would create all sorts of problems for me in my primary. You know, and, and, and then you've got J.D. Vance running around pretending as though you know, providing aid to Ukraine and sending that signal to Putin and sending that signal to Taiwan, to, to China, that somehow that is not affordable to the United States. You know, $60 billion being more or less a rounding error in our uh, annual defense bill. It was just, I got to tell you, it was a really hard couple of days. So, Congressman, as you just pointed out in what you just said, <clears throat> Ukraine has its back against the wall right now. This is a really perilous point in terms of Ukraine's survival. Wall Street Journal lead editorial this morning is about the fact that there are $300 billion in Russian reserves being held in Western financial institutions. What about the idea, the concept, how the degree of difficulty in seizing those assets and spending that money in Ukraine? Well, I think that will ultimately be the answer. And that, that conversation came up a lot. And by the way, it's a little hard for Americans to go to Munich with the, you know, Danes emptying out their artillery inventories with the EU stepping up much larger than the United States is stepping up. It's hard to then look at Europeans in the eye and say, hey, you guys are holding that money. You got to hand it over. You know, they look at us and they say, well, hey, you, you guys seem to be doing the work of Vladimir Putin. But where the Europeans are right now is that they have, they have decided that they can pay the interest on that money. That's about four or five $5 billion dollars a year uh, to the Ukraines, but they're not there yet with respect to um, uh, with respect to turning over the principal. I think at the end of the day, when all is said and done, that will be the answer. But you know, the, the argument the Europeans make is that this is a fight between countries that believe in the rule of law and Vladimir Putin, who observes no law. So we've got to be particularly careful about observing the law, and they're not wrong about that. Uh, and as I said before, you know, who doesn't have any credibility at that table is the uh, country that can't seem to get out of its own way and provide a tiny amount of aid uh, that would make all the difference to the Ukrainians. Well, and, and, and Congressman, Steve Ratner was on earlier today. We were talking about aid to Ukraine, how much we spend, how much European countries spend. You have Donald Trump running around lying, talking about how we're, you know, they're not doing their share and big countries saying, oh, we're not going to do our 2 percent. We're not going to do our share. Steve Ratner pointed out to us a couple of fascinating facts when it comes to percentage of our GDP, the United States funding for Ukraine is 0.3 percent, 0.3 percent. That ranks us. Are you ready? Are you ready from the allies? That ranks us number 31 in terms of how big of, of, of a, 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 supplies we're giving to the Ukrainians. So 31, we rank 31. And then the thing that for the J.D. Vance's of the world is saying, oh, we need to spend the money here in the U.S. We don't need to be spending the money all over. Well, that's a lie, too, because as Ratner says, about two thirds of that 61 billion dollars, about two thirds of it goes to U.S. companies, goes to U.S. suppliers, two thirds Two thirds of that money of that bill goes to American companies. And, and so, again, their, their lies fall flat, whether it's Donald Trump lying about other countries not doing their part or our, our senators and House members, Republicans lying about the fact that this is a giveaway to Europe. It's just not. Yeah, and remember, Joe, the other thing, you're absolutely right about that. Again, on a relative basis, uh, we're pretty uh, squishy compared to the Europeans, right, compared to the size of our economy, compared to per capita donations. The other thing that I've been dealing with for weeks, if not months, is this argument, and every Republican says it, which is that we need to secure our border. And until we secure our border first, we shouldn't be worried about the Ukrainian border. That's their talking point. Well, guess what? This whole idea that we can't do both at once, we are a country that runs a Medicare program, a Medicaid program, a space program, a foreign aid program. You know, we're helping the Taiwanese. We're doing we're doing a thousand things around the world. And yet the Republicans have somehow decided that there's a trade off between helping Ukraine and helping the border. So, yeah, let's fix the border. What if we came up with a Senate bill that got strong bipartisan support that Mitch McConnell would say was the best deal they're going to get better than the deal they would get if Donald Trump was president? What if we did that, Joe? Oh, wait a minute. We did do that a couple of weeks ago. And and 
the Speaker of the House and House Republicans said, sorry, we're not going to do that. And you know why they said that? Because they would much rather run in November on chaos in the border than actually even genuflect in the direction of solving the problem at the border. And what did Trump admit? He admitted just that. He said, blame it on me. I don't want admitted this. I don't want the border problem fixed. Mm -hmm. I don't want it fixed. Let the fentanyl come over for the next year. Let let illegal immigrants come over for the next year. Migrants come over for the next year. Trump said, I don't want it fixed because they may get some credit for it. Yep. Uh, ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee, Democratic Congressman Jim Himes of Connecticut. Thank you. And they're already campaigning on the lie that Biden didn't fix the border. Right. When he could have, but Repu Republicans wouldn't let I, him. I, I tell you what, you look at what Jim Lankford said. Yeah, I know. Uh, one of the most conservative Republicans in the Senate when he got to the floor. It was incredible. Yeah. He, he said people told him. They were going that hadn't even read the bill. They said, like hard right uh, 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 Trump supporters said they were going to try to destroy him if he put this bill on the floor. And he said they've they've actually kept true to their word. Mm -hmm. They're trying to destroy me. That's what Jim Langford said for putting together a bill that Republicans in the Senate call the toughest border security bill ever. They've had two opportunities to be Republicans, and they've passed on them so far. Uh